It's my pleasure this afternoon to kick off our second half with the introduction of Mr. Sandeep Mathrani. He's the Chief Executive Officer and Director of General Growth Properties. <clears throat> He's been in that position since January of 2011. General Growth Properties has been in the shopping center business for more than 50 years. They've created some of the country's premier destinations, which I know represent some of the highest volume stores represented in this room, like Alamoana Center and Glendale Galleria, Tyson's Galleria, and of course, Water Tower Place in Chicago. The general growth portfolio totals roughly 140 million square feet of space. That's a lot of assets to manage. Prior to joining the company, Mr. Mathrani was the president of retail for Vernado Realty Trust and was responsible for all of its U.S. retail real estate and its India operations. Mr. Mathrani joined Vernado in February of 2002 after having spent eight years with Forest City Ratner, where he was executive vice president responsible for that company's retail development and related leasing uh, locations in the New York City metropolitan area. <clears throat> Mr. Mathrani holds a Master of Engineering degree, a Master of Management Science, and a Bachelor of Engineering from the Stevens Institute of Technology. In addition, his knowledge of business strategy and operations, due to his role as Chief Executive Officer, enable him to provide contributions and facilitate effective communication between management and his board. Please welcome me this afternoon. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Sandeep Mathrani. I hope I can live up to that uh, introduction. Good afternoon. So I, I don't know what your day's been like so far, but I think mine's just going to be a story. So you can actually take a snooze, you can take some notes, or enjoy the story. Um, this coming Monday, April 16th, 2011, will mark the two-year anniversary of General Growth Properties going into bankruptcy. Before it went into bankruptcy, it was one of the largest companies in the world. It owned 200 properties, mainly malls, but also strip shopping centers, office buildings, and master plan communities. It happened to be the largest bankruptcy in the real estate industry to date. Nothing I'm proud of, but the turnaround is fascinating. In 2009, we were faced with a credit crisis, high overall leverage, and inflexibility among the lending community. Despite the many predictions and armchair quarterbacking that GGP would not survive as a standalone company, we emerged. We emerged with a strong balance sheet and with a strategic plan for growth. As a matter of fact, today, we are the second largest retail real estate company in the nation. Let me share some of the history of General Growth Properties. It was started by the Buxbaum brothers. There were three of them. They were from Marshalltown, Iowa. They owned a chain of grocery stores. They had a desire to put all merchandise under one roof or the traditional department store. In 1954, they were poised to grow their store, their store base. They found a site in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and they wanted to build a store. The owner of the land did not have the wherewithal to finance the project. Hence, the entry point of the Buxbaum brothers to become owners of real estate. And that was the birth of General Growth Properties. In 1956, they opened Town and Country Shopping Center in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. General Growth Properties became a public company in 1972. An interesting tidbit. Their first set of board of directors included a fellow Midwesterner by the name of Warren Buffett. GGP was focused on growth, of increasing their net operating income at almost any cost. They did it through 
acquisitions, development, and redevelopment. 2004 was a historic year for general growth properties. By midsummer, it had acquired eight malls for a price tag of $8 billion. Before they could even digest this acquisition, they launched onto the prowl to buy the Rouse companies for an estimated price of $12.6 billion. Rouse had great assets, high productivity malls. GTP funded this acquisition through corporate debt, up financing project level debt. GTP infused $500 million of equity in a $12.6 billion acquisition, i.e. 95% leverage. I think we were the poster child of the subprime crisis. <laughs> GTP increased net operating income from 2005 to 2008 by 21%. Pretty impressive. You would say the acquisition of Rouse was working. However, at the same time, we took on an additional $4 billion of debt. A term used in our industry to define leverage is debt yield, which is nothing more than net operating income divided by debt. The higher the debt yield, the worse off the leverage. Our debt yield was 2.5. But to make matters worse, we had a high amount of near-term debt. The subprime crisis, as I'm sure most of you remember, or hopefully have forgotten, led to the collapse of Lehman Brothers. This impacted the commercial mortgage-backed security market, which was GGP's principal way of refinancing our debt. It's interesting, the CMBS market was an $18 billion market in 1995. By 2007, it had grown to $229 billion. That's not the impressive part. In 2008, it shrank to 2.7 billion. In 2011, we clawed back to 32 billion, and 2012, we expect to go to 40 billion. It's not even 20% of its peak. I'm gonna take a quote from Rich Moore, an analyst with RBC Capital. He said, in this environment, no one can get a loan. When you're a company like GGP that's desperately in need of capital, there's a, real estate, there's a real threat that you can go insolvent despite your good assets. Banks won't lend to each other, much less lend to real estate. From fall of 2007 through 2009, consumer confidence shrank. On September 15th, 2008, GGP's share price fell 10%, while the larger S&P index dropped 5%. By September 2008, GGP was in dire straits. It had $900 million of debt coming due, and there was no way to finance that debt. Over the next three weeks, GGP's share price plummeted. It lost 80% of its value. It closed at $3.32 on October 7, 2008. At this time, what most companies do is they rid their CFO, and the CEO steps down. That is exactly what happened to GGP. Two of the board members, Adam Metz and Tom Nolan, filled in the vacancy pretty immediately. Adam became the CEO, and Tom became the president. Because of their knowledge of the board and of the company, we lost less than a beat. The market reacted positively, the shares started to climb. This new team decided to sell assets to raise cash. I can only tell you today, I'm glad we sold no assets. Unfortunately for them, but fortunately for me, they were not able to sell the assets. The reason the asset size was big, there was a lack of liquidity, and the potential buyers were looking for a fire sale. 
After several months, the lenders pushed general growth into bankruptcy. Why was the bankruptcy successful in restructuring our debt? The reason is we sort of had this cutting edge, we changed the law. Some of you may know that malls are financed or assets are financed by single purpose entities. And the purpose of single purpose entities is to be bankruptcy remote. So how do we file for bankruptcy and file all these individual single purpose entities into bankruptcy? GGP argued that the boards of these various single purpose entities were the same. And hence, there was really no single purpose entity. It was controlled by one company. The judge acknowledged and allowed the company to file all, call it 250 single purpose entities into bankruptcy. When we filed under bankruptcy, we had over $29 billion in assets, $27 billion in liabilities. So we actually had what you would call, we were not underwater, we still had $2 billion of value. However, we had $18.4 billion of debt coming due by 2012. This wall of debt was the culprit that caused this company to go into bankruptcy. Not everyone saw doom and gloom. There was a very smart, I think he's still young, I think he'd like to be considered young, hedge fund guy by the name of Bill Ackman. Bill ran a company or runs a company called Pershing Square Capital. Bill decided that this company had great assets and they, were, they would be able to restructure their debt in bankruptcy. So he started accumulating shares of this company. By January of 2009, Bill owned 24% economic interest in general growth properties at a cost basis of 71 cents per share. The stock today is over $16 a share. The year and a half between us filing for bankruptcy and emergence was one of uncertainty and drama, which was actually spelled out in numerous articles in the Wall Street Journal. During this time, GGP's main competitor, Simon Property Group, was eyeing the company. Principally due to antitrust reasons, we think the board decided to go ahead with Brookfield Asset Management in partnership with Blackstone, Pershing, and Fairhome to reorganize the company. In October, Judge Alan Gruper gave his green light that the company had reorganized itself, and on November 9th, on November 9, 2010, we emerged from bankruptcy. GGP restructured. It's not 1.5 billion, it's 15 billion. I wish it was 1.5 billion. $15 billion of project debt. We recapitalized by $6.8 billion of equity. The most interesting thing of this bankruptcy, I know it's hard to say there's successful bankruptcies and not successful bankruptcies. We paid every creditor, every creditor, 100 cents on the dollar, 100 cents on the dollar. On the contrary, we're fighting a lawsuit now where there's a slew of banks, okay, who actually have put us in default because of our bankruptcy and are seeking the penalty rate of interest on their loans, even though the loans were kept current and actually many of them have been paid off. So there are some creditors seeking over 100 cents on the dollar. That I would consider a successful reorganization. We achieved recovery of the equity holders. As Bill Ackman's basis is 71 cents, and I think we're a little over $16.5 today, you could say that he made a pretty penny. We spun out a company called Howard Hughes Corporation, which basically took over our development assets and our, our master plan communities. I was approached in late 2010 to take this company out of bankruptcy and start a turnaround. I decided to take the role for two reasons. One, it had great assets. Or two, or better still, one again, is that we had great people. On Jan 17, 2011, when I joined, 
I brought along a slew of new executive management team. The reason for bringing on the management team was not because the existing management team was weak or poor. It just needed an injection of new blood. So we brought on people from finance to leasing to development to legal. And the goal was to be able to spread new blood through the entire organization. I felt I was the heart pumping and they were the arteries carrying the new message across the country. On my first day, I spelled out my 100-day agenda. You can't have a 100-day plan. I know people talk about a 100-day plan. It just can't exist because no plan is done in 100 days. And my focus was the 2,000-plus employees of General Growth. While we certainly own 25 of the top 100 malls in the country, our portfolio included B malls, strip shopping centers, and office properties. In looking three, five, 10 years into the future, it is my belief that premium malls will have space at a premium. We began a year-long activity of dispositions. We've disposed of over $3 billion of assets in the last year, and ironically, our share price went up by over $2 billion. So it proved a point that better quality income gets a higher multiple. We spun out a B-Mall company. Ironically, we called it Rouse Properties. I guess when something bad came in, you gotta take the bad out of your system. And we went from owning over 170 malls to about 130 malls today. Today, we own 125 of the top 600 malls in the country. By the way, we own 78 of the top of A malls in the country, which as a percentage of total is higher than any other mall company. Malls account for 98% of our net operating income. We leased in 2011 over 11 million square feet and brought our occupancy to 94%. While one side of the house was right-sizing our portfolio leasing our portfolio, the other side of the house was creating a stronger balance sheet. As I mentioned earlier, what took us down was the wall of debt, near-term maturities, and the amount of debt. My number one goal was to make sure we don't go down that path again. So we ventured into laddering our maturity, which is spreading our debt out over a long period of time. We've successfully landed our maturities all the way to 2022. By the end of 2011, we financed over $4 billion. We now have over $1.5 billion of liquidity. 2011 was a year in transition. 2012, I hope, will be truly where we begin making great strides towards our goals. We have a plan in place. We have a portfolio comprising of high performing assets with high productivity. And most importantly, we have our people in place. I will suggest that the University of Chicago Booth School of Business has completed a comprehensive case study on GGP. I would recommend, if you're looking for good reading, some very good lessons, it's a good piece to read. We're past the rough waters, and as I like to call it, my ship, GGP, is charting a new course. Thank you. Um, I'll answer it a couple of ways. First is I do believe that the mall will survive. And the reason the malls will survive long term is because it has the tenants that generally are not easy to shop on the internet, okay? Um, the mall is still the best American pastime. And what we've done to make sure of that is we've actually started to have our malls to be a place where there's activity. So we're very focused on what I call local activities at the mall that people can come in and watch, whether it be I was at 
Park Place Mall a little earlier today, and I was told by a marketing person they were doing these chalk drawings. So we create art. Um, so I, I actually do believe that, in addition, the strip shopping center industry is going to continue downsizing. And a great example of that is Best Buy. Best Buy is a 45,000 square feet store, and what people do is they go view it, but they buy everything online. And there's a lack of, I think, service. Well, the suggestion I gave the CEO was you should reduce the size to 15,000 feet and come into the mall because the malls actually have foot traffic. I mean, Apple is a great example of that. And be able to have higher productivity. So I actually think as time goes on, the malls will continue to get stronger because we're going to bring in all sorts of uses where people are now sort of... Uh, fragmented and bring it out of the mall. And we're doing that every day, whether it be the big boxes, whether it be fashion tenants, whether it be activity in the mall. And look, I haven't spoken to you, Terry, about uh, how omni-channeling works, but in talking to many of the department stores, there's a four to one ratio. Every dollar spent on the internet, four dollars is spent at the store. Um, so I actually think that six to 800 malls will survive. And if you think about that, the country is over-retailed, but the mall business is actually under-retailed. I'm not sure I answered your question. But... Correct. Hey, Sandeep, uh, Tom Red from SAP. Uh, great presentation and uh, quite an eye-opener, and congratulations on your work. My quick question is on the side of when you went into this, I'm way back here. Yeah, I see you. Um, when you went into this, how was it with the kind of the, maybe you can comment on the the people, the teams, your associates, kind of how was their mood as you read the, as you read the press during those years you've mentioned, you saw the feed from the media, how did you handle getting those people turned around as well as the numbers turned around? You know, I've got many of my people here who've been here for 10, 12 years, you could ask them that question. Um, but to answer your question, you know, I, I, GGP employees really are pretty resilient. And it's not, I, I would say it's GGP employees, but human beings are pretty resilient. Okay, so I think they took it well, very well. They took change well, if you think about what they went through. Um, and I think the toughest thing to do is to change the culture of an organization. So we've just started the turnaround. We've just started the, 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 the change of the culture. I'll say I'm, f I'm not even on, on first base yet, okay? Are they just getting used to the new management team? I think so. Are we getting used to the way GGP works? I think so. You know, when you have, we started off with 3,000 employees in January 2010, 2011. I have 2,000 now. So has there been a lot of change? Yes. Are they getting used to it? I think so. And I think we're a long way from home. That's my biggest challenge. Yes. China, traveling and visiting malls in other parts of the world, uh, Australia, uh, that there's often grocery retail in the mall. And that does seem to be you know, a weekly trip driver. Uh, in the US, we don't have that for the most part. You know, we sell olive oil, specialty shops, that kind of thing. So is it because of the scale of the country? What do you attribute that to? Well, firstly, I'll tell you, I'm a big proponent of putting uses such as the grocery store into the malls. I actually think the mall should incorporate all uses. I just told you a little bit about the best buys. I mean, for example, we would put a Dick's Sporting Goods into our store, REIs into our malls. So we're a big proponent of bringing all uses under one roof. As a matter of fact, just to, uh, at, at Park Place, we are putting in a Total Wine, which is a wine sort of store. And we think it's a great complement versus, again, just trying to put in more soft goods into a store. It's not really the grocery store. But the reason this country did not do that is because this country has proliferated with strip shopping centers. And the grocery store was a convenient shopping. And because it was, and, and you could do many more of them. And so the grocery stores gravitated towards the strips. And the malls, say what you will, were a little bit of a snobs. And they didn't want that sort of a use within the mall. Today, that is changing. We put Whole Foods into our malls regularly. 
a lot of the earth fare into our malls regularly. So we've all become now proponents. Um, and a Westfield, a competitor does that as much as he can, and I would do that as much as I can. Yes. So we heard earlier today about um, you know, how retailers are trying to reinvent the uh, store experience um, as a way to Im improve that part of their, their overall business uh, and profitability. Yet we see that even for the store-based retailers, uh, the majority of their growth is, is through internet sales. So they are, as we've heard with Omnichannel, they're, they're, they're extending their brand across multiple channels. I've got to think that that's got to represent a tremendous challenge for a company such as yours because you are first and foremost store-based and store-dependent. I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on that as a, as a, you know, what a growth strategy would look like for you and is there a brand associated with, um, with those malls that you're thinking of creating that might help you to counteract some of that? Okay, so I'll answer that many different ways. Uh, and um, one is, one interesting factoid is that the percentage increase in internet sales is from a smaller base. So as a percentage, it's a very large number. Okay, I'm not going to belittle that because almost 9% of all retail sales is the internet, which is quite a large number. Second is hard, the, 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 the malls or retail store sales have continued to go up for the last 24 months while internet sales have also been climbing. That's interesting. You're not seeing, if I saw retail sales starting to plummet, while internet sales started to go up, I would, start to, I would start to panic. Not to say that we're not concerned, but we're not panicking, okay? And I think the reason for that is that we're not doing any new developments. So if anything good comes out of internet sales, is that maybe us, the developers, will have some sense and stop increasing our base. And if you do that, then real estate starts to becoming, becoming important. The next thing I think you heard me say that several department stores have this four, you know, four to one ratio of internet sales to bricks and mortar sales. What I find interesting on the few companies I've spoken to, it's not, for example, I'll quote a, I'll quote Saks just for the sake of, you know, you know. Saks, if you have a store, uh, if you have an internet site in Omaha, Nebraska, no one's buying on Saks.com. What they are doing is they're buying it from a 25 to 50 mile radius of an existing store. So all they're doing is increasing their profile of people who are not shopping there. It has not reduced so far, okay, the sales in their, in their, in their markets, okay? We still haven't mastered delivery, as an example, right? Okay, I you know, live between New York and Chicago, so there's a doorman who can accept my goods. What happens in Omaha, Nebraska? Maybe, you can, maybe if you have a FedEx guy who knows, you can leave it in your backyard. But there are problems with it. So I don't think it goes away. I think people learn how to omni-channel and use it to their advantage. And there is one other fact which no one really talks about, which is the existing, store, the existing department stores and store owners have a huge base of physical bricks and mortar stores. So they're the ones who actually have to learn how to do it together. They cannot become an Amazon instantaneously. What are you going to do, fire 2,000, 200,000 people, get rid of your real estate? What do, you know, so it's not practical. So I don't think I need to be at the forefront. I think we need to work together with, with, our, with our partners, which we do constantly. Um, so one last fact, Amazon, okay, which is a, 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 a leader in the industry so far, is a zero margin business. Okay. They didn't make any money last year, I think 0.5%. I think if Terry's company or my company did that, we'd both be out of jobs, right? So sooner or later, I do think they'll focus on what's most productive, okay? And so you'll start to see some of that sales start to trickle back. Right? And once there's an even playing field, there's no sales tax to do on internet sales. That'll start to even the playing field. The last thing is Amazon is looking to open bricks and mortar stores. Why? It proves that this country still has omni-channel. Could this be a different picture 20 years from today, 30 years from today? I'm certain of that. But I don't think the retail past, the, the American pastime of going retail shopping will go away. So, 
but believe you me, we're very focused on watching what's going on in the internet. Yeah, excuse me. I'd, I'd just like to ask a question from the perspective of, um, as a mall operator, what, what role do you think you play in uh, assisting and um, uh, benefiting the retailer themselves? Uh, in other words, we've been talking about the, the nature of the industry, but what do you do to help what, what's your role in, in, in facilitating and, and assisting the retailers in your portfolio? Okay, so the two things that we, we focus on aggressively, I mean, maybe three. One is a mall's success is based upon the diversification of its tenant base. So if you provide tenants that people want to come to, the mall can succeed, right? So we want to make sure that we actually provide the most current fashion or non-fashion tenants in the mall. Two is we, we, cre we, went, we went backwards a little bit, at least at GGP. Okay, everyone's focused on social media via the internet. We decided to be social and social, i.e. the first social being that the mall is where you come for your activities. So whether it's for Christmas, whether it's for Easter, whether it's uh, every weekend or every second weekend, we must have a new activity in the mall where people come to. So we're bringing people back in the old-fashioned way. We're not losing sight of social media. So we have a mobile app called The Club that has four and a half million members, okay? The tenants are finally beginning to take advantage of our database. For the longest time, everyone was sort of creating their own database. So we are focused on creating that sort of a database. We're creating the malls where we have free Wi-Fi. So there are a lot of things you can do to create activity. We're putting TVs in our food court so people can watch the ball game, okay? So there are many things people like to do. And by the way, the one thing I'll tell you is people go to the mall really to see other people. This country is suburbia, okay? You can sit and watch television in your house and it's pretty lonely. And so if we can create that activity where people come to the mall, it's a place of gathering. Actually, I commented today as I walked around, I said the, the day was so beautiful, it was 8.30, we were in one of our malls here, and I saw mall walkers, okay? Why, why do people have mall walkers here? It's not because of the weather, it's where people can come to. Not everyone belongs to a club. They come to the mall, they walk, it becomes social, they go to the food court, they buy coffee. So you wanna create you know, a different set of programs to allow people to come into the mall. So I, I, we do a lot to, to work with them. And if we feel a tenant is not performing, we go all out to help them, whether it's marketing, whether it's help, uh, and we do that all the time, whether it's assistance in giving them a new restaurant, so we'll do everything in our power to make them succeed. And the reason, again, is failure for tenant is not healthy for us. So. Yes, sir. Hi, Tom Julian. So you've done a phenomenal job of transforming both Tucson Mall as well as Park Place Mall here, and you've got some wonderful new stores coming in like Typo. Would you share with us and the students maybe your short list of some of the new specialty stores that you're trying to get into your properties and maybe why you like them? Again, we won't quote you, but just some broad insight, even if they are a global brand like Typo. Thank you. Um, firstly, I did nothing. You know, the leasing team was sitting here. Lisa, Gordon, and team did all the work. I just get some of the credit um, uh, for it. So I, I actually applaud the leasing people for doing the great job they've done. Um, so, so when you talk about some of the new tenants, one is we have a few things going on. We have existing tenants for the first time coming up with new concepts, okay? Limited Brands, which owns Victoria's Secrets, is now rolling out a concept called Pink. They were rolling out a concept called Henry Bindel's Accessories. For the longest time in our industry, we had no new concepts being built. For the first time, we're seeing mature retailers coming up with new concepts. You have existing concepts like Victoria's Secrets expanding their footprint, which is also very positive, They're highly productive. So for the first time, again, we're seeing a, 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 a desire by tenants to increase their square footage. We're seeing new tenants come into the market, which is where you were heading, okay? The one story that I find to be fascinating is one of H&M. H&M is a Swedish retailer who came to this country over a decade ago. We opened a store in Salt Lake City, okay? And you would not say that Salt Lake City is cutting edge of fashion. However, okay, when we opened that store, it performed, even if it was only for a week, better than the Fifth Avenue store in New York City. Proves the point that it took them a decade 
but they're no longer considered to be a Swedish store. They're now considered to be the American store. So we have foreign retailers looking to come in here. The part I think I find the best is, I think we were ch chatting about this a little bit earlier. We were talking about Europe. And what we said was, we had a lot of our American retailers rushing to Europe to grow, okay? Now Europe is in distress. And what we're seeing is, yes, the European retailers want to go to China, they want to go to the Middle East, they want to go to India. By the way, some of them have been there for a decade, they haven't made money yet. Why? Because consumer spending is still not there, okay? I can, I'm Indian, so I can say this. In India, when you're going from bare feet to flip-flop, you don't care for a brand, right? So you, you don't see that yet, okay? What is the place where we know it's true and tried? The United States of America. So we're gonna see a lot of Europeans coming here to grow their base. I was talking to the people at Giorgio Armani, and they said, we're rolling out our Armani, Emporio Armani and Armani Exchange. We used to only go to big markets, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Miami, New York. Now we wanna go into 50 A malls. We wanna go to St. Louis. We wanna go to different places that we've never gone. Why? Because the growth where they were coming from has been cut off. Zara, so we're seeing these European retailers coming in and expanding. The Canadian retailers have nowhere to expand. They're coming down south. The Mexican retailers, okay, know that they can perform, are coming up north. So we're seeing a lot of foreign retailers coming in and growing. So for the first time in the mall business, we're seeing square footage taken away. And we were chatting, we sort of walked through, uh, you know, again, we were in Tucson Mall also earlier today, it has 480,000 square foot of inline GLA. And I was pleased to hear from the leasing people that there were a number of retailers underrepresented. And you would normally say a 480,000 square feet mall in Tucson, Arizona is a big mall, okay? That you can't possibly lease it more. But they are. Microsoft coming up and doing new stores. They plan to open up 100 new stores in the next two years. So I think for the first time we're seeing an influx of new tenants. You can see I'm pretty optimistic and energized by it all. Okay, thank you very much.